name is Alison Donnelly and uh, I am the EWPN Ambassador for Ireland. And again, we're delighted to host this. This is actually the fifth event for EWPN in Ireland, but it is the first of 2021. And um, we're delighted to be joined by another group of really um, excellent leading payments professionals to panel discussion on uh, payments in the post COVID world. Hopefully it's not too early to say we're post COVID just yet, or maybe we're just future looking. And um, we'll be getting started very shortly, but I wanted to just mention to you a little bit about EWPN first. So just in case you don't know, um, EWPN is European Women in Payments Network. We're a not-for-profit organization that is building a community for women in cards, fintechs and payments in Europe. Uh, normally every year we have a conference where um, those of us lucky enough to get away for a day or two are able to network properly in the old school kind of way of networking actually in person. But of course, uh, the pandemic and lockdown has put paid to that certainly last year. And, um, and, and we've changed our format. So we have, uh, we, we are having these webinars and there's a whole series of webinars um, that have been recorded and are available on the YouTube channel which I encourage you to go and take a look. Great entertainment if you're having to do some ironing or something equally tedious. It's always nice to follow up, catch up on some payments um, material in the background. Um, networking is really, really important um, and sometimes uh, not something that women or um, minority groups are able to access for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, research shows that networking is uh, one of the, the um, primary reasons for women to drop off the workforce, especially first generation female professionals. So it's it, so we recognize it's really important. That's why we're looking to build a network. Um, so to that end, whilst this isn't the sort of personal interaction that we would love to have with you, please do feel uh, very welcome to get connected with us, either by joining EWPN as an individual member, and you can do that through our website, and or uh, joining our EWPN Ireland LinkedIn group, please do get in touch with me or, or, or go through the website directly to make sure you're connected in. Um, and so now to the main event, it's my pleasure to welcome Michelle Johnston to the role of moderator. Uh, Michelle is then, uh, you kindly introduce yourself and then introduce the panel. Michelle is going to moderate the discussion for us. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thanks for the great introduction. Um, my name is Michelle Johnson. I am the head of um, the UK and Ireland for Effectsco Payment and Effects, and I am absolutely delighted to be here. Um, we are really excited. I've been speaking to all of the ladies on this panel, and I'm very, very excited to see what we can offer on um, optimizing the payments funnel, the effects of COVID-19, and to take um, some of the conversation from you know, the macro level changes that COVID has brought straight down to the micro level changes and understand how we can make things better, more optimized and serve our customers and our, our clientele better. So with that, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll, we'll get on with the panel. So we'll start with Sharon Brennan, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll go around. Thanks everyone. Great. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Alison. Hi, everybody. My name is Sharon Brennan. Um, I am Head of Technology and Business Change in Banking and Payments Federation Ireland. Um, I've been with BPFI for approximately five years, working on a number of um, collaboration initiatives with um, our members across both the tech and business space. And prior to that, I spent a long time with Bank of Ireland. So delighted to be here today and looking forward to the chats. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Jenny. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Jenny Fox. I'm Director of Commercial Business Management in Erlingus. Really delighted to be here today. If the, if the preparation um, that's gone into it and some of the sharing of thinking in advance is anything to go by, I think we're in for a very exciting um, hour today. I head up um, a fairly newly created team in Erlingus. That's the Commercial um, Project Management Office, the Market and Competitor Insights Team and the data analytics teams in commercial. Um, only six months in the role, and that was quite uh, fun in terms of setting up a new team remotely during COVID. 
um, prior to that, I spent quite a number of years as head of um, retail for Aer Lingus. So basically anything you may have purchased on aerlingus.com that wasn't actually the flight itself, um, it was probably me that placed it there for you to purchase. So really looking forward to today's conversation. That's great. Thanks, John. Jenny is one of our merchant experts who's come in. Our second merchant expert is Emer McCarthy. Emer, would you like to introduce you all? Sure, thanks Michelle. Um, my name is Emer um, McCarthy. I'm the Group Strategy and E-Commerce Director with Kilkenny. I've been with Kilkenny now for over five years and I started my journey there as the Group FC. Um, Kilkenny, uh, for everyone who might not be familiar even with the brand and the call, is the lar largest supplier of Irish design products across Ireland and the founder of Champion Green, which we're really proud of. So um, that's also a hot topic at the moment and definitely has come up quite a bit during COVID, the desire to support local. So um, just want to say thanks, Michelle, for the invite today and really looking forward to the discussion ahead. Brilliant. We're looking forward to it. And we're... Finally, we've got another banking professional, um, Neve O'Connor. Would you care to introduce yourself, Neve? Looking. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I am Neve O'Connor. I've been working in banks for about 20 years, maybe a little longer, but I don't want to admit it. Um, I always tend to gravitate towards payments for some reason. And most recently, I was program manager in Ulster Bank for PSD2 and Open Banking. Um, and I've also taken on a role as the lead for intelligent automation in Ulster Bank. Um, delighted to be here. We've had great fun preparing um, and apologies to my fellow panelists if they didn't recognize me when I arrived on screen today. I look remarkably different today. Everybody looks remarkably different from our rehearsals. Um, absolutely. Um, it is good to have our Zoom faces on for a change and um, just see how how, how professional everybody can look when we don't have our hoodies on. That being said, it does kind of go into the theme of change that we've been talking about. Um, I've just, my personal experience is I moved into the role of head of UK in Ireland on March 12th last year, which was just about when everything went into lockdown. Um, I had been with this company before, but my expectations when I interviewed for this role and my expectations when I started the role and what I needed to do were substantially different. Um, substantially different and, and quite surprising. And we have gone through those changes, we have weathered those changes and we've come out a stronger team. But COVID has caused a lot of changes that were already in progress to accelerate. It's brought forward changes that um, we didn't necessarily anticipate, and that's affected everything. So just jumping straight into it, we know that COVID has been a phenomenal catalyst for change. It's impacting almost every aspect of our life. Most of the time we wouldn't have had to say, look, we're in makeup when we're at a professional thing, but hey, here we are. Do you think that these changes are gonna persist in the future? And are we at a pivotal moment for innovation and payments? Emer, do you wanna kick off? Sure, I guess. Um both at a macro and a micro level, really, we've seen a fundamental shift in consumer behaviour um, towards digital payments um, since COVID. And in particular, it's really for the retail side across e-commerce and also then across contactless. And um, from an e-commerce side as a company, we've seen treble digit growth. We've seen across e-commerce, we've seen new customer segments online and a new demographic and also a shift to support local. And then alongside that, we've seen with the introduction of new sales channels like telesales, et cetera, a huge uplift in contactless. And I think that the change that has come about really has been something very significant in 2020. Um, some people are, are saying that in the first 10 weeks of 2020, we've seen more of a shift and a change in this payment space than we had seen in the previous five years. And, and I guess something I read recently, which really kind of resonates with that is that um, 2.1 million, I think in December, um, uh, people were using daily contactless payments. So that's an absolute fundamental shift. And really, Michelle, I mean, when we think about will this stay for the future, this type of behavior, I think absolutely a lot of this is going to stick for sure. I mean, if we look at the past and what we've seen with previous events like SARS or the Spanish flu, we've seen with SARS that contactless continued afterwards, face wearing or face mask wearing, et cetera, continued afterwards. So we do expect this behavior certainly to stick going forward. And I think really the challenge for us in the industry will be to continue to innovate in this digital payments world to 
um, cater for all customer segments as part of that and um, because the behavior certainly feels like it's here to stay um, I don't know Jennifer have you seen something similar in the airline space um, I suppose unlike yourself Emer, um I had a very different experience in our in our lingus during COVID so um Firstly, to acknowledge the topic of the transition to digital payments, I guess in the Erlingus context, that transition for us had taken place quite a number of years ago. We were already more than 80% um, online at the point of COVID. So the shift to digital payments was not new to us and the shift to e-commerce was not new to us either. Having said that, um, it did accelerate a couple of things for us. For example, the move to a cashless aircraft. So if you're now traveling on an Erlingus flight, the food, drink, or um, beauty products you may purchase on board, they're all now conducted in a contactless or a cashless manner on board. So that was one thing it did accelerate, I guess. Um, the bigger shift for me was actually that our payments funnel had to adapt overnight to actually going into reverse. So we went from a situation um, on the day before COVID to the following morning where 90% of our typical booking numbers simply stopped overnight. And at the same time, a fairly substantial increase in transactions actually going out the door by way of refunds began to occur. So I guess for us, it was a sudden realization that the normal behavior and pathway of customer books a flight, customer actually travels on the flight could actually come to a stop over the night. And it brought to the fore for us um, the underlying problem that I guess had never really been of much significance um, previously. And that was that our front end ability to service those customers um, from a refunds perspective was actually hampered by um, the underlying back office and manual processes that simply were never designed to cater for that volume of payments going in the wrong direction as a retailer. So that was really, really interesting um, and obviously challenging. So I guess personally, um, in the context of Erlingus, I really hope that shift goes away and goes away fast. Um, and I guess that would be echoed by my peers in the hospitality and leisure industry. I have a couple of people I know working across um, gyms and things, and they've seen the exact same pattern of payments going the wrong way on things like gym memberships. So I guess we would all hope that it would definitely not persist. I, outside of my experience as a retailer, if I just touch on something I've noticed as a consumer, I think... I have observed um, a changing demographic in terms of digital payments. For example, older or less digitally literate people are now using um, e-commerce or digital payments than ever before. And I guess I am not entirely sure the data is painting the most accurate picture of that customer behavior because I do wonder how many of those people are actually receiving help from either trusted friends or families to conduct those payments. So if we as retailers or merchants are looking to maintain that um, increase in, I suppose, footfall through our e-commerce channels going forward, I do think we need to think more about accessibility um, in the future. Yeah, just touching on that, I suppose, from a banking perspective, well, the banks had introduced a lot of changes very quickly to support things like payment breaks. They also looked at introducing things like companion cards for older people so that their family and friends could could help care for them while they're cocooning. And there's also been um, a launch of junior cards on the market as well, which is a similar concept for, for younger people, as well as, as that the contactless limits were amended so that more transactions could go through without people needing to use their PIN. So the banks are doing their, their best to support the current cards infrastructure and to help make those, those things more available to the elderly and the vulnerable and those who may not be used to it just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I suppose just from, from my perspective, um, which mainly would be looking at the banking sector and touching on a lot of the points um, that the girls have just made, um, I think at an industry level, it certainly put a full stop on, you know, what BAU was. Um, the, the typical payment instruments um, and the shift in behaviours that um, have already been, been mentioned um, Cash, as we all know, is on a massive decline. I think, well, six to eight percent up to 2019, and that jumped to down 30 percent in 2020. Now, um, I would question as well. You know, a lot of that that behaviour is, I suppose, um, 
um, impacted by the various lockdowns and whatever else, and similar for the online activity and the contactless, which again was massive. I think Q4 2020, um, one billion in value. Um, and I think the, the volume and value of contactless payments has gone up, I think 24% of 60%, it's just, it's just insane. Um, but I think from, from my perspective, um, working on um, the launch of a new mobile instant payment app for the Irish banking sector, um, one of the challenges that we thought we may have when we started three years ago was how would we make something so digital and savvy be appealing to the mass market and not just that segment that are digitally enabled and comfortable. And I think COVID has allowed that digital leap to happen for, for many people, definitely accelerated that. So from, from my perspective, um, I, I think that that's very useful. Um, but I do think equally um, the lockdowns and, you know, to the point of being the assisted payments and that kind of thing, I think once once we re return to some level of normality, it'll be interesting to see, do we land in some sort of middle ground? Um, so, so keen to, to see what happens there. Um, I think also across many sectors, um, they have had to re reinvent themselves. And I'd be very keen to see that like at a European Commission level, that the, the regulation and the policies to support all that digital um, um, behavior are developed to support that. Um, so it'd be interesting to see that too. And then I suppose, Michelle, back to your point around, will it stick? Um, will it persist? Um, I think one thing um, that everybody has got very comfortable with is, you know, that non-linear and um, I suppose transitional um, nature of a, of a payment, albeit on whatever instrument you're using and, you know, the stop start nature, leaving your basket, returning to it later. and that flexibility that people have definitely got used to. Um, now, a lot of us would have been familiar with it before then, but I think that's that's going to be a behavior that a lot of people are very comfortable with now, and it will be difficult to, to reverse or engineer that into your classic bricks and mortar environment. So um, I think a certain amount of it is going to stick, but possibly not everything, Michelle. Yes, yeah, some of the things that may not stick, it could be as a result of PSD2, where barriers are being put in the customer journey there will be more stop start as a result of that we're going to see more of it over the next number of months where people are stepping out of that payment journey to add an additional layer of security it is for the customer's benefit it is to prevent fraud, fraud and to increase security but it does have an impact on the payments journey but then the same regulation I know that the retailers here don't want that. I know the banks didn't want particularly to apply it either, um, but it is the regulation and it has to be enforced. So it's about looking for, you know, what kind of exemptions can we have because of fraud rates, et cetera, where we can increase the transaction value that can go straight through without having to apply that, that second layer. Um, mm -hmm. Or adding, say, the likes of Aer Lingus or Kilkenny Shop if you're a regular shopper mm -hmm. as a trusted place where you can use your card. But the same regulation also has given a space for fintechs to operate more easily in the market to apply for newer licenses where there will be new ways of initiating payments that may result in more competition in the card space than what we've seen in the last number of years. Um, they, cards kind of have a monopoly on e-commerce, so it's great to see something else coming into play and it's great to, to know that some of those fintechs are very interested in operating in Ireland. That's very interesting, Niamh. Um, So just to, to speak to the payments funnel specifically, and you were, and you were doing that in, in for the most part with speaking about PST2 regulations and bringing in new fintechs and things like that. Um, actually, before I continue, if anybody wants to answer ask questions, please put them into the chat. We will be answering them at the end of this webinar, so feel free. We'd be delighted to have some interaction from the audience and we'll, we'll, we'll answer those later on. But to go back, to talk about the payments funnel specifically, I think to go along with Jenny's point, people would have thought initially that optimizing the payments funnel is all about converting to sales. And I think what COVID has done are converted to purchases. Um, if we want to do that from a PSD2 or innovation perspective, from a app perspective, from a merchant perspective, 
what are the essential ingredients to ensuring that customer journeys are seamless? And um, whether that's in online or in store and what are some of the gotchas? You've outlined some need. What else, what other issues need to be considered when we're looking at making that payments funnel a seamless experience? So the payment journeys as they're being as they're being designed need to be user centered design. So it has to be about the person and the steps they're going to have to take, how many clicks. It's about the customer's bank, knowing them, knowing their buying behavior, knowing what, what might flag as fraudulent or what might be a lapse in security um, and applying the relevant exemptions so that more payments go through without that second level of authentication. And that is within the gift of the banks to use their data to support that. Um, from a, a, a retailer and a merchant perspective, it's about selecting their provider. So once those fintechs come on board, giving those options to their customers that there are, are alternatives to their standard, use my Visa card, use my MasterCard to make their payments. Um, one thing that we are going to need for that, I suppose, to explode in Ireland, and one of the things that open banking payments particularly rely on in our nearest market, which is the UK, is faster payments. Um, we don't have a like-for-like -like scheme here, and that will have an impact on the number of fintechs who want to come and play in this space in Ireland, and also the number of people who want to use it. So if I'm online shopping and my payment hasn't cleared, I can't expect Emer to send me what I've purchased. Um, so it, those are kind of, we still have a number of barriers in the way, and we need to make sure then from a bank perspective that where these open banking journeys are being used, that we are giving the fintechs and giving the customers the best user experience to authenticate that payment. Yeah, I would agree with absolutely with all of that. And I suppose just to say, uh, having worked for the last three years on developing a new mobile payment um, solution for the Irish market that will launch later this year, I suppose in, in terms of, you know, we know there's a lot out there. Um, it, it's a market that's very well serviced in terms of choice, how I want to pay, when I want to pay. Um, we're very much conscious that we're entering a very crowded space um, customer ex expectation in terms of um, the seamlessness, um, the clicks, um, the reliability, the, the familiarity and comfort, and also that feeling of feeling secure, because I think there is that balance to be struck between sometimes if there's too few clicks, um, they're wondering, you know, is that gone wrong? There's, there's definitely a balance to strike there. Um, but in terms of, of servicing that market, we're very conscious that, you know, we're entering a, a, a market that we have to be best in class, not just OK, in order to have that impact. Um, so, so so I think that's that's a real challenge to anybody um, um, playing here. I suppose in terms of the gotcha, again, Michelle, um, one thing that I would be very conscious of, and I think it's very topical at the moment in terms of banking, um, you know, yes, digital first, but digital only, no. Um, like there's a huge cohort of the market um, that do need alternatives. And, um, you know, the vulnerable cohort have to be um, brought along. And I think um, that the, the outlook sometimes can be quite blinkered or can at least feel quite blinkered. And it's really, really important to know all of your customers and to think with that aspect in mind. And um, I come back to our initial starting blocks three years ago on the Cinch solution, our concern about bringing, you know, people who might be digitally um, native along and COVID has been a huge catalyst for us there. I think as well, um, another gotcha and certainly one that I have um, lived massively over this pandemic, having three teenage kids, is the whole refund end of the chain. Um, I certainly, um, we've done a lot of online shopping, none of it for me, um, but we, we've also returned a lot of things and I'm, I'm flabbergasted um, and not being from a retail back background, but I genuinely am flabbergasted at the, the, ra the range of differentiation in terms of what that experience is, you know, from being having to print off labels, use specific packaging, sometimes pay to return, um, bring to a certain location, usually without parking, um, you know, get your receipt, come home and wait. Um, 
I find that really, really challenging in, in these times. Um, and then I've had the complete opposite end of the spectrum whereby, and I used this example the other day um, when I was speaking with the girls, where my daughter bought a very expensive pair of leggings and they ripped very quickly. I was in too busy in work to um, face into the return process. And I suppose was in fear. It was a company I wasn't familiar with. Um, so it was in fear of what was ahead in terms of the return. I was blown away. Um, all I had to do was take a photo, um, attach it to the email. And within an hour, um, they had come back to tell me, please donate the item to charity. Um, please let me know if you'd like the same again or a voucher. And within that hour, I had a voucher plus an extra 10 euros on top um, for my troubles. And I thought it was amazing. And I will be back there um, without a blink of an eye um, again. So again, I think they're the gotchas that people need to, to think about. Um, you know, it has to be a 360 experience. And certainly for such a, uh, this such a choice out there for us as consumers now, um, it's the, the 360 experience will make or break it, um, I think. It's Sorry, I totally agree, Sharon, from, from, I guess, from a retail side as well. I mean, the customer is really at the centre of how we design here and what we design for the future. And it has to ask, it has to answer to every cohort of the segments that are available so that, again, you're answering what's, what's required and what's needed and you're designing with them in mind. Um, but just maybe on that, Eve, just a question that's coming to mind for me is, the level of data that's obviously coming out of this whole new world of 60% being contactless, et cetera, and how the banks are using that data to design this customer experience and what that might look like. So currently the data is not being used to its full effect. I think one of the challenges that the traditional banks are facing is that they're losing their data now because the transactions that are taking place in the neo banks are not available to them. So they're knowing they're starting to learn less about their customers than they would have done previously. Um, I suppose within the confines of GDPR, we need to find a way of extracting the learnings from that to figure out who's doing what when, how can we help them plan better, and how can retailers then tailor experiences more to what the customer does and the actions that they've previously taken. Do you think we're a long way off that, Neve? Um. Given the, the challenges in financial services at the moment, I think we could be, but I think there is a space for some of the newer open banking account aggregators to start to provide that kind of information to the market and to be able to provide it because they can aggregate from all banks. So it won't just be, you know, one particular bank's perspective. It can be across the market. And if somebody comes in and can aggregate that and provide learnings and insights, you know, within the, again, within the confines of GDPR, that, that data is an asset and can be sold on or the learnings can be sold on um, to the likes of retailers or Erlingus or whomever it might be. If I tend to buy 10 things online and return nine, just giving that kind of, giving that view that, you know, online, online shopping probably not going anywhere. It will continue to grow. And with that, the returns process needs to grow. So if we know that, you know, of all of these online shopping transactions, X number or X percent need to be refunded, then that payment experience has to be updated and improved so that customers feel more confident with it, that they're not leaving the leggings sitting at the edge of the desk for two weeks afraid to approach it. Um, but based on that customer experience, I would certainly shop for those leggings. Yeah. I think I'd have to echo parts of everyone's points in, in the last couple of minutes. I completely agree with Sharon the payments funnel has never ever been more fragmented and I think again in our Lingus context and particularly in the last year we've seen that evidence in declining look to book or conversion ratios so basically what we're inferring from that is that our customers are spending an awful lot more time thinking or dreaming as opposed to actually buying or making a purchase and we're seeing um, multiple cars abandonment before a final transaction is made so needless to say, with that backdrop, we approached PSD2 with more than more than a little trepidation, which was a which was an interesting process to be going through over the last few months as well. I think for me, um, on the data side, I and and what what this all means when you bring it together is, I think it brings to the fore the importance of things like loyalty and segmentation ever more. 
like we are going to need access to whatever behavioral data we have available to us um, and use that to serve pretty much exactly what the customer is looking for and kind of alleviate the burden of the additional time imposed upon them in the payment funnel and um, by things like PSD2. So I guess um, my ambition um, in that regard in the Erlingus context is through the use of Air Club. So for example, if you log into your Air Club account and you're on airlingus.com, I now know your past trips and I know um, what you are looking for that day. So for example, if your past behavior is telling me um, that you typically travel from Dublin to London or vice versa every Monday or Tuesday, and that you typically return the following day, then I can probably infer that your reason for travel is business. With that in mind then, I would like to be able to tailor your experience for you immediately at that point the next time you present on our homepage and select Dublin Heathrow and it's a Monday or a Tuesday again. And I want to service to you pretty much exactly what you've been looking for the last time you've had to navigate through my one size fits all um, customer experience journey at the moment. And I want to service to you the things that you've, you typically purchase. So for example, it'll be the flight you've selected. It'll immediately offer you your Heathrow Express ticket into London. It might immediately throw in um, the option to, to choose the seat in row one or two because you want to make a speedy exit from the aircraft because you're in a hurry to get to the city centre on your arrival. So I think that's going to become ever more important if we're to try and um, buffer some of the natural tensions in the payments funnel as a result of increasing regulation. I guess then in a non-airline context, again, back to consumer or anecdotal experience, I see gaps in loyalty and recognition, depending on whether you're presenting as a customer in a bricks and mortar location or in an online um, retailer presence. So I think some of the panelists here are probably sick of hearing me talking about jeans at this stage, but there is actually something to this story. So I'm a prolific user of Zara on the app on my mobile. And as a general rule, I know pretty much exactly what fits me in the context of a top or a or a jacket. When it comes to jeans, I think we all know jeans are a little bit more difficult to figure out online. So as a general rule, I'll populate a cart of a couple of pairs of jeans. I'll him and haw over it. I'll abandon the cart. I'll come back again. And eventually I'll completely abandon my cart. But what Zara doesn't know at that point is that I've actually ended up in my local branch and that I'm walking around the store at that point and I'm selecting a couple of pairs of jeans in real life and I'm taking them to the fitting room to figure out which one is the right one for me. So I think what's going to come to the fore there is the need to integrate again within the bounds of GDPR um, some form of near field communication between the app on my phone and the items I'm browsing on in the store so that it knows I've gone to the fitting room. It may not know how many pairs of jeans I have with me in the fitting room. But then when I get to the till and I've actually purchased a pair of jeans, it goes, aha, there was something wrong with the cart originally online and therefore um, the process happened in store. Then it should actually know, you know, Jennifer's bought size 12 jeans. Therefore, next time on the app, it might make a size recommendation for me based on the measurements and so on. So I think there's endless potential in the data there that might overcome some of the, the gotchas that we see at the moment um, in, in the retail perspective. I think that's really interesting, Jennifer, as well, because what we're seeing outside of Ireland is the grab and go concept, mm -hmm. which is literally going into the shop, picking up the product, trying it on virtual reality. So I like your jeans, etc. Doing your payment digitally quite quickly and leaving straight away and then replicating the same online. It's just the Irish market is probably a little bit slower in the uptake of the grab and go, but certainly it's something that has that's, that's definitely setting other markets, I think, far more ahead of Ireland in that space. And, and you can see how COVID will potentially push us going forward with greater uptake. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. From a payments perspective, when you're looking at that gap email between the bricks and mortar and the e-commerce perspective and, and dealing with that gap, are there techniques or concerns or, or ways that you're implementing to kind of bridge that a little bit more? Is there concerns about localization or anything like that going on there? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of play really when you're assessing that gap. Number one, there's GDPR and we always have to be very mindful of that and a consumer's willingness to share their information or data across channels. But really, um, most customers, I think, do embrace 
um, sharing their data across channels to have a more tailored experience. And it really is, as Jennifer is describing there, the more tailored your experience, the more personalized for that customer, the more relevant you are to the customer. And certainly when it comes to payments or, or to avoid friction across the journey, a tailored journey avoids and creates a frictionless journey. So I think customers are embracing it and want it. I think Michelle, in order to really access it, you have to have either a form of loyalty or a level of a tracking across both bricks and mortar and online. That can be, um, but some of these are no longer relevant because they're not GDPR compliant. So you kind of still do come back to the loyalty space and you know a customer's willingness to sign up with their email and in store and then be tracked later on through the online site, et cetera, to make sure that what we're providing to that customer in terms of products and experience is exactly tailored to what they expect. And it probably will result in then cart completions or increasing conversion in the digital space as a result of that. I think exactly as you've said, Ema, if I thought um, the information being presented to me in that Zara context um, was pretty much tailor-made to me, I might take a punt on the jeans then on the cart because I'm not going to be so worried anymore about the fact that I may have to return them and get into that same sphere that Sharon was talking about of printing labels off to the post office looking for parking. So I think um, it's another hurdle we can overcome with data. Sharon, from the perspective of the projects you're working on, is there is there thinking there about bridging that gap using your technology or... What are your thoughts on those those kind of challenges? Yeah, I think it's something um, that we're def we definitely have on our roadmap. Um, so the initial solution that we'll be launching later this year um, will play in the the P two P space. Um, but the whole data analytics and um, you know the the data is the new gold, if you like, um, is very much front and center to our roadmap. Um, and I think the fact that um, our, we are using, it's a mobile app. Um, we typically have our mobiles with us more than our, our children at this stage. Um, so, you know, from a, and I don't like the word, but from a tracking perspective, there is a lot of data um, that, that could potentially be gathered. But I, I really do stress that there is a balance to be struck. And I think, I think in Ireland, um, our, our data protection um, office, you know, I think would be very strict. They're very strict. Um, they there's no messing. Um, I think to a certain extent, um, there's a lot of um, value to their think thinking in terms of um, over. Um, you know that feeling you get where where you're on Facebook at night and something pops up that you might have just thought about uh, earlier in the day and you're trying to connect the pieces. Um, Big Brother is watching. Um, I certainly I know I don't like that. Um, so I think there's a balance to be struck um, in terms of how you uh, appropriately use data um, and um, without tipping over the edge and, you know, getting into that big brother space. So, but yes, it's definitely something on our roadmap. Um, and I would imagine that when you're speaking to the more vulnerable demographic or the demographic that's less savvy with digital, as we were speaking to earlier, that's even more of a concern. Um, with respect to fraud and, and, and things along those lines. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other points to make on the payment space? I know that we could talk for Ireland here in half, um, but... I think, um, again, in the e-retailer perspective, um, what surprises me in the payments funnel is a need to be more local rather than global. Um, because if you think about it, at that point in the journey, the cost, or sorry, the retailer's expectation at that point is we want to get it completed fast. We don't want confusion, nothing detracting from the overall aim at that point, which is parting with your credit card number. So for me, um, or our lingus, that's involved looking at things like um, localized pay means of payments in places like Germany, where, for example, banks bank transfer is still a preferred method of payment as opposed to card payment. Um, so that surprised me. Another one I think um, can be overlooked at times is localization in terms of language or look and feel. Um, there's another online retailer I shop with every so often. They happen to be a French retailer and um, it's, it can be English right the way through the funnel and suddenly turn French again at the payment, fun at the payment end. So I find that confusing and surprising. And it certainly stops me in my tracks when I'm, when I'm about to take the card out of the wallet at that point. Emer, that's something that you've had to consider from your design perspective, isn't it? 
Absolutely. I mean, as we move forward um, into the US market, we have to consider the localized aspect. And I mean, again, payment methods are very different in the US market. It's Apple Pay, you know, it's Google Pay, etc. And they're less dominant in the Irish market. Um, and also you can see the digital wallets. There's an uptake, I think 6% uptake of those in Ireland since they were launched in Q3 and Q4. But the reality is that's far more advanced in other markets. So it is key again, it, it does come down to data almost again to understand the market that you're targeting because if you don't localize your experience to what they want, chances are along the payment um, funnel, you're gonna lose them somewhere and you have to be tailored and you have to really have what they're looking for as part of that journey. And um, this is a question that comes to mind really for Sharon out of this as well is, Sharon, do you think the contactless 50 euro um, limit will be increased? And do you think that that would, will take a long time if, if it is being considered? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting one. I know um, there is um, some movement in the UK at the moment in terms of increasing that, that limit to £100, I think, from £50. Um, my understanding is that, that um, from, from the, the industry perspective, that the banks, they're not all, there's a little bit of diversion there. Um, similarly with the retailers, just in terms of, um, the value and I suppose the associated um, probability or possibility of um, obviously increased liability and then fraud. Now the customer is always um, protected um, in terms of you know if anything does happen um, on a contactless card and in general contactless cards are, are um, very very secure but um, I think there is a little bit of friction in the UK um, as to whether or not that would happen and I suppose it's the first it's a diversion in terms of what's happening in the EU um, I'm just aware of some um, conversations going on at EBF in the mo at the moment around this and the sense I'm getting and I'm not close to this um, I would have to deflect to one of my colleagues on this but that there's not an overwhelming ambition to go there um, the, to the hundred so um, there's nothing that there are discussions, but there's nothing um, pressing or it's certainly coming coming anytime soon. Um, that's my my knowledge of it anyway, Emer, at this point. Emer, the limit is actually set by regulation and even to change that limit would could take a significant amount of time because of the number of players in the cards journey. So between the issuing bank, the acquiring bank, there can be three, four, five parties in between and every step in that journey has to increase. So from the terminal provider all the way back to, you know, your bank account, there's a number of players that need to reset that limit. So the limit actually came into force as part of the PSD2 regulation. It was uplifted, but a number of players in part of that journey haven't applied it. So it was inconsistent until COVID kind of made everybody move that bit quicker to support the customers and support retailers. That's great. And make things safer. Thanks, Neve. I'm just conscious of time right now, um, and we do have a number of questions showing up in the chat. Um, what we might do is, um, unless we've got anything more to speak about with regard to the payments funnel, we might just jump straight to some of the questions that Alison has been curating for us and go from there. So is that okay with everyone, or is there another anything else that we'd like to add to this? Brilliant. Thank you. We've had some great questions in and I, I'm sure you'll want to, to be able to get an opportunity to tackle them and give them the, the space they deserve. So uh, the first question that came in is, um, do you think we are going to see an increase in e-wallet providers here in the Irish market to challenge the stereotypical card payments? Um, and, and do you think that more could be done to encourage new players into this space? This sounds like a new question. Thanks. Um, on the wallets piece, I'm not sure. Um, I think we have to recognize our market is quite small. It's also quite unique. And whereas previously we would have had players, I suppose, adding Ireland on to their UK proposition. Now we're going to be more reliant on players coming from the EU mainland. Um, so we, we do have to recognize that challenge. Um, there is, I suppose, a challenge for the central bank and that these these guys need to apply for licenses. They need to be granted. Um, we need to make sure that that journey to make sure people can get in and operate in the market is smooth and that the right supports are there. And I know Sharon's colleagues in BPFI and the FPAI do an awful lot of work supporting the fintechs in that process. Um, 
even in the UK where open banking went live about 18 months sooner than in Ireland, it's still been a very much a slow burn. It is a new experience. Account aggregation in the UK, because people don't tend to be singly banked like we are, has taken off a little bit quicker than what we're seeing. Because if I have everything in one place, why do I need a second app to give me everything in one place? From a payments perspective, um, my hobby horse, without instant payments, a lot of the, the players in Europe and in the UK, they don't want to come here because there's no benefit if it's not instant. And instant payments isn't just about, you know, person to person or a person paying Emer or, or Jenny. It's also about things like how quickly payrolls get processed, how quickly VAT payments get made, how, how quickly and how much money is available to be spent in the economy at any one time. Um, and I do think that, you know, as a community in payments, we should be lobbying for that infrastructure for Ireland. Yeah, I think to, to add to Neve's point, I think as well, I imagine some of the decisions or thoughts the fintechs are probably struggling with is making the investment case to break into Ireland as that small market Neve mentioned, because you do actually have to have a decent sized pipeline or pond to fish from in the first place. Yeah. And I think um, it's going to be very interesting over the next while because I do think there is an onus on regulators, banks and merchants to kind of come together and market or educate on um, these forms of payment, remove things like the, the fear of lack of credibility of them. What I mean by that being um, an example of my mother who does have a Revolut account and a Revolut card but doesn't necessarily trust us as much as she does for example her PTSB card so she carries both how do we get her into a space where she only wants to carry the Revolut card because that is the pond that the fintechs want to fish from um, yeah thank you I, I actually in my day job I help firms get uh, authorised and uh, I think it's fair to say there's no shortage of firms looking to move into the Irish market, uh, but there are, uh, you know, some fairly significant barriers to entry, not least the um, lack of instant payments, um, but, but also just, you know, it's a, a detailed and forensic job to get through the central bank, shall we put it that way? Um, but to the, uh, to the next question then, um, I think it might be best to go to the cinch one next. Uh, which is, uh, do you think we should be concerned with ventures like Cinch Payments where three main banks in the market are working together? I think we have to trust that the regulation is there to allow some of this. Um, we just need to make sure it abides by regulation and the competition authority is really the place that will apply on it. I think there's an awful lot of movement between the traditional banks at the moment. Um, and... It, it, it's always going to be a concern because as we've just gone through, our market is small. Most of the players who've come and landed in the Republic of Ireland have left. Some one Ulster Bank is leaving after 160 years. Um, so it is, it is a small market. It is difficult to, to make money here because there's only so many of us on the island. Um, so that, you know, it, it, it's going to be a problem. Um, and Another part of the problem is that our customers aren't, they're not on for moving bank. I mean, and I'm a, an offender myself, but banked with the same place since I started university because why would I move? Um, and in some cases, I don't go for better deals. I don't go for better anything because it's easier. It's just easy to stay with them. Um, I did sign up for Revolut. The only reason I used Revolut is because I couldn't load my own card to Apple Pay. And I didn't want to have my fancy new phone and not be able to tap it. So kind of a vanity project, really. Um, so I think we have to recognise that as consumers, we don't move. So we might all have a Revolut account, you know, think we're hip and cool and everything else. But the chances are we're using it for pin money. So it's the money that you go out with. It's the money that you spend in certain shops or on certain things. It's not your primary bank account for most people. And I think that... That continues to be a theme now, maybe with younger generations, admitting my age again, uh, maybe with younger generations that will change. But at the moment, there's no real sign of that. And there does, there does seem to still be a requirement to have that primary bank account with a traditional bank and people are very slow to move them. And there are 
processes there designed by the regulator to make that easier to move from A to B and to move everything that goes with it for you. There's a, a 10 day turnaround time on it and everything else, and it still doesn't happen. So there is a bit about as, as customers, we're, we're very loyal, let's put it that way. I think that's very interesting though, even it builds on what we mentioned earlier about loyalty and the data yeah. piece. I mean, it just shows if you can create that loyalty, if you have a relationship with a customer for a number of years, chances are we, we're creatures of habit. We tend not to change if we don't have to, if it's convenient, if it's mm -hmm. fast, if it's reliable for us, we're going to stick with that option. So I, I think it's, it's a key point as well in this discussion. Yeah, I think in the case of the banks, originally it was that it was so difficult to leave. And now that that kind of anecdote has persisted, even though there are new processes and things in place, to allow it to happen more easily. It just hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. I think it's also quite difficult to um, test and see whether a new yeah. provider is actually, you know, you can you can go to a different shop and try another pair of jeans on, but you can't really do that with your main bank account to, to see mm -hmm. how well it fits and then flick back if, it's, if it all goes pear-shaped. Mm -hmm. That comes back to marketing and education and information. So it, it, is, it can be overcome. Okay, yeah. good, great. Um, somebody else has raised the issue about, or not the issue, the example of uh, Swish, the Swedish mobile banking app created by a group of Swedish banks and the Central Bank of Sweden. And it has an impressive penetration rate across all ages in the market. Is there something Ireland can learn from Sweden in this regard? And, and this question was posed to you directly, Sharon. So perhaps you would like to take it first. Nowhere to hide, so. Um, yeah, Swish, Swish, Swish is a super solution. Um, we have met with them on many occasions, um, became quite familiar with the product. Um, I think in Sweden, they have that wonderful advantage that they do everything perfectly. And so do all their, their um, people. So they're, they're super digital. I think there's it's 10% cash in circulation in Sweden for the last couple of years. So um, the, the platform is great. Um, so yes, to answer, is there anything we, we can learn? Yes, um, we have looked at Swish and many solutions around Europe. And um, I suppose we would like to think um, have taken the best bits of everything um, to, to put together to serve the Irish market. Um, hopefully that answers that. Thank you. Does anybody want else want to, to pop in a comment? Any experience of Swish? Okay. Um, next question is about um, how do the panelists feel about diversity and inclusion since COVID? and the move to remote working, do they feel it's still high on the board's agenda in your respective organisations or generally? I guess from Kilkenny's perspective, um, we're largely female, 98%. I think this, this, there's two, two poor guys, <laughs> three, four poor guys in the, in the company at this stage. Um, uh, so um, I think from our side, look, what we found during the pandemic is obviously there have been a lot of staff furloughed because we obviously have had a number of um, branches closed on the back of COVID and, and not being able to operate in that environment. So from an inclusion perspective, I think we've we've tried to do our best to make sure that everyone is included through the journey of the last number of months during lockdown. And um, we've definitely seen that, you know, staying in contact with staff having regular meetings every couple of weeks with our CEO and our staff and sending out care packages, et cetera. Like, I think now more than ever, we have to consider inclusion of everybody and be mindful of everyone during a pandemic because there are people furloughed, there are other side effects from COVID that are coming out across the research. And I, I just think that it's probably one of the most important topics during this time. And everyone really needs to be mindful of that across their companies and making sure that they're mindful of their, their staff and making sure that they experience their staff or feeling during that time is one of inclusion rather than exclusion. Yeah, I think in the Erlingus perspective, it definitely bought, brought more um, cognizance of the topic to the fore but equally has actually brought some new challenges with it so I guess um what we perceive particularly in in the back office or non-flying areas of the business or the the office-based staff and um, the transition to working from home kind of forced forced evidence of that clash between family life and working life and you know we very quickly had to tailor our expectations to things like 
um, downtime for homeschooling or downtime for certain times during the day or even just the odd interruption um, with the invasion of the toddler into the room um, that tended to be something we had to react to and be flexible about quite quite quickly as everyone else did it did bring with it challenges though and it, it's something I, I don't claim to have any expertise in or, or ways to necessarily overcome but, but that flexibility did bring with it um almost an expectation that it will be balanced out at different times of the day so we do see people online now later at night to try and balance out whatever they they have missed out on during the day and I'm not necessarily sure that is the healthiest approach going forward so I think it's going to bring to it's going to bring to the fore a need for clearer expectations and um, probably more boundaries being imposed on, on how we do our work in the future. I, I would agree um, Jennifer um, like I, I think um, we're probably, we could probably could all do a little bit better ourselves in terms of setting those boundaries. And I think certainly from a personal perspective, nobody is making me sit at the desk at nine o'clock, but I am mm -hmm. sitting at the desk at nine o'clock most nights. And I think a lot of that for me is there is no reason or excuse to walk away. I would typically have a very busy and active house with, with a lot of kids. Um, and when you're not, when you don't have that reason to switch off, um, it just becomes the norm and it, it becomes the behavior. Um, so I think, I do think employers have um, a role, but I equally think um, um, individuals um, need to, you know, think, and I put myself top of the pile there in terms of what not to do. Um, so it's certainly a challenge I'm trying to set myself. I'm going to jump in there and perhaps I can see that we're nearing the end of our time, but all of us, in preparation for these discussions have talked about boundaries and setting boundaries and things like that maybe we could just go around everybody and say what's your top tip for not being stuck at the desk at nine o'clock now none of us can really put up our hands and show any examples of that but maybe we can we can talk about that um, before we wrap up i think tone from the top on that is really important so if your boss is emailing you late in the evening the chances are you're going to reply like that is so almost remembering that your team might see an email on their phone and then feel that they have to or because you are they should so that tone from the top is really important but i think it's also important not to kick ourselves too much none of us chose this some of us may have chosen to work from home in the past but this most certainly isn't a chosen environment and we just need to give ourselves a break and just try again a little bit harder the next day mm -hmm. I think there's opportunities for tech in there as well. So like like you said, Neve, you know, maybe we need to be a bit more um, respectful to our teams and not contact them after hours because otherwise they may infer a need to reply late at night. And I know we can do things like time delay in emails, but I think there's probably improvements that could be made there. So that if, for example, as a manager, and I do have a choice, but sometimes feel I do need to sit down at nine o'clock at night and get through some stuff I didn't quite make it through during the day that I have a means to do it so that it's out of my inbox and it's out of my world for a little while it has moved on but it doesn't actually hurt anyone else's mentality until the next morning so that there's opportunity there for improvement on tech yeah yeah I think so I think it's really our boundaries it's the boundaries we set and live by notionally setting boundaries and not living by them I think that probably is the time that's coming out for me um, as a result of COVID, it's putting something like that in place. In, in terms of practical tips um, in working from home, the only thing I've um, managed to successfully implement is bookending either side of my day. So the, the beginning of the day, there is a walk every morning and that means I'm probably not available before nine because by the time I get home sorted and everything else, it is 9 a.m. So I, I haven't been able to accept meetings earlier than that, except for special reasons. And I bookend the day at the other end with either, you know, a podcast or watch the news or some other means of break, breaking away from my laptop and my phone for a while just to change the scenery or almost have a, a commute that takes place in the transition from one side of the apartment to the other. I highly recommend Home and Away as a description. <laughs> I haven't watched that since college. <laughs> 20 minutes every evening clears the brain. <laughs> and a remote vitamin D hit, given that we're not flying away with our lingus to any of our holiday destinations just yet. <laughs> Day soon. <laughs>
Oh, listen, thank you so much on those top tips and um, wonderful tips that we'll all remember. Uh, thank you very much to Michelle, who has uh, planned this and then moderated the discussion so well. And to each of our panelists who've given up their time and their input and their intellectual thought. And um, we really uh, do appreciate it. Uh, I, and also to you as the audience for the questions, the, the great questions, the great discussion. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, this will be available on YouTube and uh, we encourage you to go and access it again or send it, post it on uh, social media and share it wider than that because it's a discussion that is certainly worth uh, being heard much further than just this, uh, albeit sizable group, uh, small nonetheless in comparison to where it should be. So uh, let me thank you everybody again and um, please do keep in touch. Thank you.